Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. God willing, today I wanted to talk about a verse in the Quran uh, that gave me a lot of uh, insight after I read a book by a person known as Matt Ridley. And the name of the book is called Rational Optimist. And uh, God willing, I'm going to be using a lot of the, the content from the book, but I think it has a lot of parallelisms to uh, this verse in the Quran, which is in chapter 24, verse 55. This verse reads, the header says, God's promise kings and queens on earth. God promises those among you who believe and lead a righteous life that he will make them sovereigns on earth as he did for those before them and will establish for them the religion he has chosen for them and will substitute peace and security for them in place of fear. All this because they worship me alone. They never set up any idols beside me. Those who disbelieve after this are the truly wicked. So what does it mean to be a king and queen on earth? Because because God says that he promises us that if we believe and lead a righteous life, that he'll make us sovereigns on earth. So let's look back at what it means like historically, because, you know, the, the kings and queens uh, of the past are the ones that are really emanated, uh, constantly cited in a uh, historical text. And let's look at one in particular. It's uh, King Louis XIV, also known as the Sun, Sun King. So he reigned from 1643 through 1715. So let's see what kind of life did King Louis live, because he was a king, and he was a very, you know, eminent king, uh, and every night he could pick from 40 different dishes, and can you imagine just having such a selection that, you know, you tell your chefs, hey, I want anything of uh, 40 dishes, and they'll whip it up to you, uh, lickety split, um, and he had 498 people prepare each meal. So he had a staff of just shy of 500 people preparing every single one of his meals from breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Um, and he was rich because people worked for him, right? This showed that he was a sovereign. He had all this, uh, this wealth and he had all this staff and people worked for him. And we see this a lot in, you know, the old show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. We would see, oh, you know, these uh, mansions, they have staffs of people serving on them. And, um, but you think about this, anyone pretty much this day, especially if you live in the United States, can go, and you don't even have to be wealthy. You can go to a supermarket and purchase fresh, frozen, tin, smoked, organic, pre-prepared beef, chicken, fish, turkey, lamb, tofu, uh, ostrich, bison, you name it, they have it. Uh, and then on top of that, the, the garnishes, the beans, the potatoes, the cucumbers, the beets, the carrots, the strawberries, any time of year you want, you can go to the supermarket and pick up strawberries, blueberries. And you think of all the selection that we have. King Louis, during his reign, could not possibly comprehend the amount of luxuries the average U.S. citizen has. Most people in the developed world have. And, uh, you know, you realize that we have way more selection, way more better quality than what was available at the highest ranking individual of uh, their time. Or let's say, for instance, you don't even feel like cooking because, you know, King Louis, he had a, a staff of 500 people. You think of this, within probably five miles of where you live, uh, you can choose between Italian, Chinese, Vietnamese, Mexican, Cantonese, Japanese, American, Ethiopian, Indian, Greek, Persian, you name it. You know, countries I uh, don't even recognize, I can go and have trained chefs who basically trained their entire life in this one particular uh, uh, style of cooking and get the best meal. And they will have a team of people to serve it to you, to pour water for you, to get ice for you, to uh, make sure that your food is of the utmost quality for your satisfaction. I mean, King Louis would be blown away if he saw this today. And you think about, you know, his clothing, right? King Louis is a pretty stylish guy, probably had all kinds of crowns and gowns and capes and, you know, whatever else uh, fancy kings wore at that time. But, you know, today you can go to the mall and you can get, you know, shoes, shirts, jeans, ties, dresses, you know, made of cotton, leather, polyester, silk, linen, uh, alpaca, wool, nylon, you name it. Any style, any uh, type of clothing you want, uh, you can go to the mall and pick it up. Or you don't even have to go to the mall, right? You can just go on your computer and... And, you know, just ordered off uh, Amazon, Overstock, or any of the other department stores' uh, websites, and someone will deliver this, the goods to your doorstep. Now they have 24-hour uh, delivery, uh, Google Express, Amazon is getting into this, and, uh, you know, we take this for granted. 
we think of the kings of that time, we're like, wow, they had it so well. But we forget, like, God created a system where literally all of us can be kings and queens on earth. The difference is the person who's constantly in need, constantly, uh, you know, unappreciative, sees all this and they complain. They're constantly complaining, constantly bitter. You know, the believer sees this and they're just enthralled. They're enchanted. They're saying, you know, what a, a glorious gift that I can pick up a phone, dial a number, and someone d delivers a hot, delicious pizza to my doorstep. Um, you know, think of the millions of people involved in the supply chain, in this delivery process, right? raising the cattle, growing the grain, plowing the land, uh, creating the, the transportation mechanisms, the box carts, the, 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 the trucking, uh, the refrigeration, uh, providing the gas, right? I mean, you know, gas pipelines have such a bad rap, but by God's leave, I mean, this is the uh, energy source uh, for our uh, for our homes, our transportation, uh, our computers, you know, all this stuff. And, um, you know, the roads that they travel on, someone had to go pave those. And the thing is, it's just, it's transparent for us. But by God's leave, that person who paved that road had an incentive to do that. And it was our blessing, right, that we get to utilize this. And we don't think twice. We don't think it's uh, uh, strange that, hey, you can just pull out of your driveway in your machine, uh, <laughs> machine or your car and just, you know, drive from one city to the next or across the country or even help, you know, take a plane and go to a completely different continent. Uh, or if you want to take a cruise and you can relax the entire way. I mean, can you imagine what boat rides were like at that time? People who wanted to go across country, yet alone cross uh, the Pacific or the Atlantic to travel to new lands. I mean, the majority of the people wouldn't make that trip or they would have severe uh, disease, famine, starvation. And uh, we do it in such a luxury. We have a staff of people when you step on a plane, you sit in a seat. They're delivering to you peanuts and drinks. Can you imagine this, a, a trip that used to take months, if not, you know, someone's entire life because they didn't make it. And now we're going in such luxury. Uh, and, you know, we, we still, we complain and we take this for granted that we can take this heavy piece of uh, machinery, uh, put it up in, uh, in, in air and tr uh, travel it across the globe. All the science, all the work, all the engineering that's gone into this that we just take for granted and we expect that, yeah, I'm going to book a ticket, I'm going to get a plane, and I'm just going to go. And by God's leave, it's such a blessing, such a miracle, something that should allow us to always be appreciative. And can you imagine, I mean, if this technology, King Louis or Pharaoh or any of these uh, kings of the, the, the past uh, knew about that, you know, you can pick up a phone. Call someone across the globe, and now you have FaceTime, you have Skype, uh, and be able to just have instant communication. You know, no more smoke signals, pigeon communication. Uh, that's all out the door. <laughs> and you realize that we have literally millions and millions of people for generations and generations who have been laying this groundwork for us to live such comfortable, prosperous, blessed lives. And it's something that we should never be unappreciative for. Not only are we kings and queens, but we're exponentially better than the kings and queens of the past. And in chapter 36, verse 33 through 36, it reads, One sign for them is the dead land. We revive it and produce from it grains for their food. We grow in it gardens of date palms and grapes, and we cause springs to gush out therein. This is to provide them with fruits, to let them manufacture with their own hands whatever they need. Would they be thankful? Glory be to the one who created all kinds of plants from the earth, as well as themselves and other creations that they do not even know. You think of this. Do you know the machinery that was involved to create your light bulb? Do you know the, uh, the process by which uh, fossil fuels were made? So we can basically drive our cars, uh, heat our homes. Um, do we take this for granted? You know, are we thankful? Uh, have we become complacent that when we hit a switch that we have a light? Now, think of this. In the past, in the time of King Louis, they had something they were known as wick trimmers. And this was the uh, you know, utmost of luxury. Someone who would come in and they would light your candles for you and uh, trim uh, the wicks off the candles so it looked nice and you know you had light today we have switches you don't have to hire someone to come and uh, <laughs> to, to, to set your lights for you and um, 
think of this. I mean, think of the, the millions of people involved that, that it took to basically uh, make this light switch uh, functional. Everyone from the, uh, the coal producers, the natural gas producers, the oil producers, uh, to the infrastructure, to the d distribution of power, to the electrical systems, to the, uh, the components inside the electrical systems, to the homes by which you reside on, from the builders that built those homes that you step into and you, know, you, you lay your, uh, your sofa and your bed, just, you turn on the, the faucet and you got fresh water that you can drink. And um, <laughs> let's look at how, you know, there's a, a metric by which you can look at uh, how much work would you have to put in? How many hours of work would you have to do to get one hour of light? So an hour's worth of work today, just the average uh, American works one hour a day. In that one hour, he earns enough income to power basically light for 300 days for himself. That's how, I mean, how productive our society is. That's how much of a blessing, meaning that, look, the average person in the past, let's say in the 1800s, they would work uh, one hour and that would gain them 10 minutes of reading light. Okay, look at this comparison. 2014, you work one hour, you get 300 days of reading light from that income you've earned in that one hour. In 1800, you work one hour, that only earns you 10 minutes of reading light. That is absolutely phenomenal. So how long would it take to work to earn an hour of reading light? Just one hour. And let's look, okay, today would cost you less than half a second of work, right? You work for a half a second and you have one hour worth of reading light. In 1950, you would have to work for eight seconds to get one hour of re reading light. In 1880, you had to work 15 minutes for one hour of reading light. In 1800, you had to work six hours for one hour of reading light. And in Babylon, in 1750, you had to work 54 hours to earn the money to buy the, the candles, the oils, whatever was necessary at that time, to earn one hour of reading light. How much of an improvement has this been since 1750? 43,200 43, fold improvement. Meaning that that's how much more productive we've been. Meaning that reading light, as far as a priority on, uh, for our day to day, has diminished that much because it's become such a staple. But don't let us ever take that for granted. This is a blessing from God to show whether we're going to be appreciative or unappreciative. And in chapter 2, verse 152, it reads, You shall remember me that I may remember you and be thankful to me. Do not be unappreciative. So God willing, let's all be appreciative the next time we uh, turn on a light, the next time we go out to eat or we go to the supermarket, you know, and you see people they're at the supermarket line and they just they lose their cool because they have to wait, you know, five minutes to check out to go buy their delicious strawberries that were imported from the other side of the globe during winter season. OK, so let's be appreciative. Let's always be thankful for uh, for God's blessings, the system that he's uh, provided for us uh, to not only nourish ourselves, but to also become a productive member of society. God willing, uh, if you got any uh, comments or questions about this, feel free to email us at QuranTalk at gmail.com. And uh, feel free to uh, also post anything on the uh, iTunes page. Uh, until next time, peace and God bless.